Welcome to No Filter HD episode 94. Ballistic Coffee Boy here, your host. So in this one, guys, we are finishing off Llama Soft, the Jeff Mentor story, which is a fantastic interactive documentary by Digital Eclipse. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, so right now we are on chapter four, The Tempest. Llama Soft finds its existence in peril as it attempts to navigate the raging storm of the British games industry. And let's go ahead and start on up, guys. It says, Lost and Found. As the 80s gave way to the 90s, times were getting tougher for independent developers as the games business became more compar uh, cor corporatized. As the stakes grew larger and larger, Lomasoft's very existence was threatened. Where are all the consoles? While game consoles from Nintendo, Sega, and others were very popular in the US and Japan during the 8-bit era, this was not the case in the UK, where neither the NES nor the Master System made significant inroads. The game's business was still dominated by computers, which are open platforms friendly to indies like Llamasoft, but this status quo was changing as 16-bit game systems took over. Uh, cool guys, here is a, a little article here, or a magazine, very nice. Andy's attack. Having finished Tripatron and Merak, Jeff turned his attention back to traditional games, choosing to port some of Lavasoft's classics to the ST with enhanced graphics and more features. The first was a version of Andy's attack. Very cool. Love that artwork. Andy's attack ST original painting. Jeff was very open to me experimenting with the artwork, says artist Steiner Lund. I combined different approaches, utilizing a graphic banded color approach to the skies in the game and more realistic rendered alien craft. Love it, guys. Hopefully, the llama was saved, he says. Here's a preliminary sketch by Steinerlund. Love that. Andy's Attack ST ad. A full page ad for the ST version of Andy's Attack gives its official release date as January 23rd, 1989. We are almost in the 90s. Here's an Andy's Attack ST manual, guys. Um, didn't just include instructions and a backstory, but a history of the various versions of the game, a bit of behind the scenes info about its development, and even some Alambasoft's philosophies. Very cool, guys. Make sure to check these out if you're interested. Just pause and read. Andy's Attack Tripatron. A later ad featured Andy's Attack alongside Tripatron. Love it. Andy's Attack Floppy Disk. Here's the Atari ST version. We are squarely in the three and a half quarter floppy days. All right. <laughs> uh, Super Grid Runner. Shortly after releasing Andy's Attack, Jeff updated his classic Grid Runner, again with higher quality graphics and new features for the Atari ST. Let's take a look at this uh, cover here. Very nice. And play it. So, two Llama Complexity and 89 for the ST. A 16 bit updated the Llama Soft Hit. Super Grin Runner adds a nose cone option for your ship that can be strategically deployed to alter your shot formations. Uh, so, it says this is uh, original ST release running on Atari Jaguar hardware. Pretty interesting.
Hey, I'm trying to see in here about the music for this game. It is pretty low. I don't know why. And I don't think I can turn it up. Maybe it's just how the game was. So let's just keep playing, guys. So I know this volume is low in this game, so I'll just keep talking, I guess. Um, I really enjoyed this game. It, it's fun. Um, I do have a problem with the audio in this. It's, it's just kind of too low for me, but it's such a fantastic little game. I love it. Um, never played this before, obviously, and it's just really cool. I love how you can put your nose cone out somewhere, and I love that screen. That's really cool. So I wanted to say I apologize to my last episode of this. Uh, the actual video clips inside LlamaSoft were a little choppy. That's because my OBS decided to be a a, a big dork. So um, I'm not sure what's going on there. But I think I have it fixed. Let me know if I have not. But So this is the final part of LlamaSoft, the Jub Mentor story. This is Chapter 4, The Tempest. And uh, this is Part 5 of this series. Because I think Part 2 or, or 3, um, or Chapter 2 or 3 ran a little long. So... But just such a cool game. I love playing all these games. In this chapter, we're going to dig into Jaguar games as well. And it's going to be so cool as we um, get to the end of this. Um, just love this game. Let me know what you think. I also wanted to let you guys know this episode would be about, um, it's about an hour, 20 minutes, so it's about um, 80 minutes long. That's because um, I finished the game, and i show you the credits, and also at the end, it, um, if you fully complete the game, it unlocks a special game, I believe. I could be wrong, but anyway, that's what it looked like to me, so stay tuned for that. That's really cool. type in some random letters here and move on. What a cool game. I love it. Awesome. Let's take a look at this instruction manual, guys. I'm not going to read these to you. It'll be here all day, but uh, here you go. Feel free to pause on these. Very nice. And let's move on to the next. Super Grid Runner Floppy Disk. The floppy disk for Super Grid Runner. Mentor Views. Yak grows complacent and join the success of LlamaSoft. The nature of the game's market is changing. Companies get larger and more serious about the business. Eventually, LlamaSoft began to find it increasingly difficult to get distributed, being unable to match the advertising budget and prolific output of the new software corporations. All right, the British Games Console. Around this time, a British maker of gaming joysticks called Connex announced that it was developing a video game console. The Connex Multisystems claim to fame was that it would include controls built into the hardware. The player could swap in a steering wheel, motorcycle handles, or a flat yoke. 
depending on the game. And this is the start of the Atari Jaguar story in a way. Flare 1. A September 88 article in the Games Machine discussed the Flare 1, the underlying technology that would become the Connex multi-system. It notes that the designers came from Sinclair, where they had been in development on a Super Spectrum. Really cool. Slipstream. By November 88, the Flare technology was powering the upcoming new system from Connex, which is currently codenamed Slipstream. An article in the Games Machine detailed the current state of the project and noted that it would be released in the summer of 89. Disc Games in 3D, an update as the yet unnamed Connex console in the January 89 issue of the Games Machine discussed more details about the types of software that it's said to run. Coincidentally, the same page also carries a story about Atari preparing a game console based on the technology of the Atari ST. And it never shipped. The Dream Machine. While the Connex multi-system was only mentioned in overseas gaming magazines as an odd footnote, and indeed, if it was mentioned at all, there was a great deal of enthusiastic coverage in the British gaming magazines of the time, like in the March 89 feature in the Games Machine. It was seen as a serious contender to the in the coming 16-bit console wars. Riding High, an article published in the Games Machine magazine at 89, states that the multi-system would be available with 15 games that August. Connix even planned to release the pictured hydraulic chair peripheral. Llamasoft is listed as a developer. I can't wait to get in there and start blasting, Jeff is quoted. Time rushes past. A June 89 article from the Games Machine magazine notes that the Connix have been slightly delayed to late September, but the developers are still waiting on the hardware they need to create their games. Jeff obtained a Connix dev system around that time, which was about $5,000, or £5,000. Was we conned by the December 89 issue of the Games Magazine, the reporting on the Connix multi-system had become far more skeptical, as it was clear the console would not be released. Really sad. Jeff continued developing Attack of the Mutant Camels 89 for it, though. Wow. We've been there before, right? Uh, so let's go on over here. Photon Storm. While sales of independent Lomasoft games dropping on the Connex system nowhere to be seen, Jeff takes Lomasoft into new territory, producing games to be published by Atari. The first game, Photon Storm, is a shooter inspired. Uh, ga uh, it's, it's inspired by Sanitar, actually, uh, which is cool. Photon Storm Review. A review of the Photon Storm in July 1990 issue of the Games Machine notes that this project, uh, product produced the guru of programming returning to games after a long absence. Talking about Jeff Minter. Minter Views. Lomasoft tries something new. Rather than sell the Yaks output directly, they sell the games to another firm to market. That firm is Atari UK. Yak does a complete... Or sorry, Yak does a couple of games for them, but the sales are not enough to prevent the steady erosion of the resources acquired during the golden years. The Yak begins to be worried. The Yak is losing it. <laughs> From light sense to visualizers. In 1990, Jeff was contracted by Enmos, the UK-based maker of a powerful computer processor called the Transputer, who wanted to show off the capability of their chip with a real-time light display set to music. So Jeff created the first virtual light machine, or VLM, oh, for the transputer. Very nice. VLM through the years. VLM O was the beginning of a series of music visualizers that Jeff would design for the Jaguar, Nuon, Nintendo GameCube, and Xbox 360. This video shows the evolution.
just an awesome video, guys. Attack of the Mutant Camels 89. Jeff spent seven months and a good part of Lomasoft's dwindling resources developing Attack of the Mutant Camels 89, which was canceled alongside the Conics multi system in mid 1990. This is the playable but unfinished version. Shows what might have been if the console had come out. Now, this is actually a really cool game. I love it. So, its complexity is two camels inspired by a video game based on the Empire Strikes Back. Attack of the Mutant Camels became Lomasoft's signature game and horizontal shoot em up in which the player must shoot down a slowly advancing line of genetically modified camels. Let's take a look, guys.
I can play this forever, guys. I'm going to have to go ahead and try to stop this game here. Um, very cool, though. I love that. <clears throat> Minterviews. A Welsh company called Conix is developing a new game console based on a revolutionary design by a bunch of Cambridge designers known as Flair. The act develops a game, Attack of the Mutant Camels 89, for the system, investing seven months and five grand. Connix run out of money and the system crashes and burns before it gets to market. The yak is annoyed. Uh oh. Here's an original painting by Steiner Lund. Um, very cool. He photographed a camel at a local zoo. It was very helpful and posed like a pro. Love it, guys. <clears throat> Attack of the Mutant Camels 89 preliminary sketches. Steiner Lund's original concept materials for Attack of the Mutant Camels 89, including a mock up of what the cover might look like. Very cool. Atari Panther. Following the demise of the Conic system, Atari UK also decided to attempt to break into the wide open British console market with a 16 bit system called Panther, which is based around the same Motorola 68000 processor that powered the Atari ST. Very cool. So Jeff uh, got an early dev kit. Says that's the second time I've been working on a system only to have it shot down underneath me. At least this time it hasn't cost me much except time. Pity, the Panther was very good. I had some wicked demos coded when the axe fell. Very cool. Shareware. In the early 1990s, independent devs like Apogee, Epic, Mega Games, and ID Software were finding success with Shareware, giving out games for free and then asking users to send money for future episodes. Shareware distribution had not been tried as much in Europe, but Llamasoft was ready to buy it. So really cool. Llamaton uh, 2112. Inspired by the classic shooter um, Robotron 2084, Llamatron uh, 2112 was the first Llamasoft title to be released as shareware. I love this, guys. Can't wait to play this one. This is a fantastic game and such a classic. Let's go ahead and play it. So complexity of two llamas in 91. Blast the invading robots while saving the sheep, llamas, and other innocent beasties. Considered by Llamasaw fans to be one of its best games, Llamatron 2112 was originally released as shareware, relying on fans to send a donation to Jeff directly if they enjoyed playing it. Let's play it, guys. Such a classic game.
Such an awesome game. Just love it. So let's go ahead and uh, save it. Look at the instruction manual. I could play this all day. Um, this is a really thorough um, instruction manual here in this text file. So go ahead and take a look at this if you'd like. I definitely couldn't read this, but such a fun game. I love Llamatron 2112. I actually have it for my Atari Jaguar CD. I think it's a bootleg copy I got from eBay. I had no idea it was a bootleg. I just purchased it one day. But it's definitely a fun one. I love all the iconic symbols that appear, like the Coke cans um, as enemies, you know, the telephone, all these electronic quote unquote conveniences. I think that was done on purpose, but I love that. Such a great game. The Yaka Surprise. The game does extremely well. Atari ST owners pay up in droves, and although the monetary input is insignificant compared to the VIC-20 days, it is sufficient to keep the corporate camel lid head of Lamasoft above water and ensured that Flossie, the prettiest sheep in the world, does not run out of digestive biscuits. That was from a Lamasoft website in 1995. I love it. So Jeff is happy about that. So this famous photo, a 1985 photo of Jeff standing in front of a rainbow at Igazu Falls in Brazil was digitized for the Atari ST version of the game. There it is. Just love that. <clears throat> the Shareware Gambit. Distributing Llamasoft 2112 as shareware not only solved Llamasoft distribution problems, it also inadvertently brought Jeff and his army of fans even closer together. Very cool. As the 16-bit era advances, we were having difficulty getting our games distributed. We'd always relied on getting into distributors to go to WH Smiths and that kind of thing. That was how we sold our games. And we sold some mail order, obviously, but most of them at retail. <laughs> I loved Robotron, so I'd been working on the Llama Softy style Robotron game. And as I was getting fairly near to completion, I, think I felt it was quite a decent game. And I rang around a few places seeing if they'd be interested in publishing it, and nobody was really interested in it. There wasn't really any market for my type of games. It, you know, this fun scene that we'd started out in, was it, it wasn't like it was disappearing, but it was mutating into something else. It started getting more commercial, uh, and then you had like, like arcade licenses became more prevalent than film licenses, and then you needed to have mar more marketing to get into the magazines, and then the distributors would only take you if you had so much of an ad spend every month. And it seemed to me that if you wanted to stay in that scene, then you had to become something other than what you'd been before. And I didn't want to become something other than what I was. And I think I, I, I was just being stubborn, basically. I, I didn't want to give it up. So I'd heard of this thing called shareware. In the early days, shareware was very pure. You actually gave the software away complete. And people paid you if they were getting the value out of it. And I just thought, well, you know, why don't I try doing that? I got in touch with SD Format and they said they'd put Llamatron on their cover disc. And so I wrote this famous text file which I put on the disc where I basically explained the concept. Here is the full copy of Llamatron. If you like it, then pay us a fiver, which was also considerably lower than the price of software, which was about 15, 20 quid for a game in those days. And we'll give you a copy of Andy's Attack as well. We weren't the first people to do it by any stretch. It was being done quite a lot earlier in the US and there were certainly other people doing it in the UK. But I think we were one of the first to be seen to be doing it. Llamatron was probably the real breakthrough game where I actually managed to get a degree of, of mass appeal. That was a big stepping stone for me in terms of understanding what motivated Jeff and, and his kind of genius in, in video game development really. Even if you had seen Robotron, I don't think I would have put the two quite together, you know what I mean? Because Jeff had totally done something <laughs> unique with it. Robotron is a ruthless arcade game. And I wanted to make 
a game that was kind of robotron -y, but was more accessible. The main thing I did was to give the option for the player to have this little droid which kind of followed you around and helped you. A little AI droid would go around and shoot things for you and collect beasties for you and actually really genuinely usefully help you out. And it made that game a lot more accessible to a lot more people without needing the absolute mad skills that you need to do it. Robotron itself. I'm looking at an enemy and going, hang on a minute, am I being chased by an umbrella? And do I have to catch that to make it stop raining? That makes sense, but it wouldn't exist in any other game. But somehow, in the games that Jack writes, that logic just kind of clicks into place and you go, aha, yes, get umbrella, that stops the rain, the rain is bad, the umbrella is sentient, that's fine, now I'm gonna go after this telephone. <laughs> But if it was just like a load of things being thrown at you, there wouldn't be a lot of entertainment in that. And actually, I'd say Revenge is a little bit like that. Um, Llamatron itself is, is great in that those things move in specific ways. They've got predictable ways of moving. They're not just things bobbing about. Like items in the game will have their own like behaviours and characteristics as well. It's just so fun and so ridiculous, yet somehow completely and utterly makes sense within its own world. It's a nice blend of Jeff Minter and Robotron. So it's just this beautiful mix. And people absolutely love that. People love the fact that we trusted them to take this game and, uh, and they could basically test it for themselves. And, and they loved the game and they, they sent us money. We, and it was a time when we weren't making a lot of money, so it really did save our ass at that point. And it was quite moving because loads of people, as well as sending money, they sent letters telling us how much they appreciated it, how much they loved it. And at one point, there was a point when this was all kicking off. I was living in, in, in Kumkeek and I had a fax machine. And my fax machine every day would just go with rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls of faxes of my mum just faxing me these letters that were coming in, of people just expressing their joy at having been trusted to pay for this game only if they liked it. And even though people sent me more money than I asked for because they thought I deserved it. It was lovely. It was, you know, from, from going through banging your head against the wall with you know, recalcitrant distributors to this outpouring of love was extraordinary. Just loving these videos. They are just amazing. Love this, love this. So Revenge of the Mutant Camels ST. With the panther having gone extinct and the jaguar far off in the future, Jeff went back to the Atari ST, developing a new version of Revenge of the Mutant Camels. Like Llamatron, this was also released as shareware, with users asked to send a donation. Very cool. Revenge of the Mutant Camels, uh, complexity of two camels in 91. Take control of a mutant camel and get your revenge on waves of enemies. The Atari ST update adds the goat-like and sipital character as computer-controlled buddy or a second player. Let's take a look.
I could literally play this all day too, guys. What a fun game. So let's take a look at the instruction manual here. Uh, huge text file again. Lots of cool info in here. I definitely recommend you read this. Um, kind of describes a certain time of Mentor's life he was going through with shareware. And it actually brought him a lot of joy that fans were writing to him and sending in donations that they liked the game. Um, much more than dealing with a company, right? Or some kind of corporate uh, game publisher so very nice so just loving playing these games these are some of my favorite jet venture games these later games i love these i my only complaint is is i wish they were more of the newer games in here so i'll talk about that later atari jaguar released in late 93 atari's final game console was a successor to another machine mentioned earlier in the timeline the panther no the Conix multi-system which is based on the Flare 1 technology, while the Atari Jaguar was actually the Flare 2. Twin 32-bit processors leapfrogged the 16-bit technology. Very cool. It was not a commercial success. Tempest 2000. Widely considered the best game release for the Jag, Tempest 2000 was the perfect marriage of Jeff Mentor's two loves, trippy light synthesizer visuals, and shoot 'em up arcade gameplay. So, very cool. So, this is long considered to be Jeff's masterpiece with entrancing light and sound effects. Everyone knows this game, guys. Let's play it.
Super Zapper Recharge.
I just love this game, guys. It's so good. It is just fantastic and just such a big piece of the Jaguar uh, franchise, right? I mean, it is the Jag game to have, thanks to Jeff Mentor. And he talks about this more in detail here in a minute in the video. I can't wait to show you that. And so here's the instruction manual for the box Jag cop or Jag copy of this game. I do own this in the box. Very cool. Um, here it is for you with all the screens and everything. Just love it. What a great game. Inside the Tempest. When Jeff attended an Atari JAG Developers Conference in 92, he couldn't have imagined he would come out with an assignment to make what would be the JAG surprising killer app. Let's watch this video, guys. I think Jeff has a fascinating history with Atari. There's no escape in the fact that Atari have been an incredibly important part of Jeff's career. I mean, obviously Jeff has a huge soft spot for Tempest. It's sort of about those glowing analog color vectors that's just absolutely stunningly beautiful, especially when compared to the other artwork of the other vast artwork of the day, when it was crude and blocky and, and, and not very satisfying to look at. This thing just was a, a thing of beauty in and of itself. And it made a deep impression on me. Tempest was a game which never really made it over to the home systems of the day. You, know, you, you could have Donkey Kong and Space Invaders and all the rest, Pac-Man and all those made it out, but Tempest was something special that never actually made it through. When he had the opportunity to work with Atari and they said, who wants to make the next Tempest game? I mean, I'm assuming he was just there at the meeting just going, <gasps> me, me, me. I was at the stage where I had a pretty friendly relationship with Atari in the UK and in the US, really, and doing some stuff on the ST. And it got me into the Jaguar on the ground floor, really. I went to a Jaguar DevCon and then got developers to come along and hear about it. They said, we've got various IP we'd like to put onto the Jaguar. We'll read out some names if you're interested, stick your hand up. And they said, Tempest. I thought, Tempest? I stuck my hand up. At that point, I'd never done any 3D stuff either. I'd never done any vector stuff. I'd never done any polygon stuff. So I was actually a bit scared doing it. I thought, because I don't actually know how to do any of the things that you need to be able to do to make that game. What? Well, I was able to get enough together to be able to do this game reasonably well. I got the basic Tempest working on that and was just doing outlines. Uh, my producer was trying to edge me towards doing solid graphics and for a while I didn't want to do that. I, did, I thought I'd rather have a higher frame rate and keep the wireframes. But he was quite correct. He pushed me towards doing the, the filled polygon stuff. I had to admit, when I put the filled polygon stuff in, it did look a lot better. I think Tempest 2000, there's a lot of firsts in there for him that have stuck with him that are characteristics and signatures of his style. In terms of stuff like uh, feedback. I discovered the visual feedback effect I had in Tempest 2000. Quite by accident, one Monday morning, just I'm getting up, sitting at my breakfast table and thinking, hmm, what would happen if I plugged the output of the, of the, of the blitter back into itself? <laughs> and came up with this lovely sort of feedback. I then spent the next two days playing about with this game. Whoa, this is amazing, this is really trippy. He managed to make certain aspects of that game look organic rather than digital and like dynamic rather than just like static. It wasn't a bunch of 2D sprites flipping through frames. It was like an algorithmic expression of math up on the screen. And those things are new to me. Those things are consistent to his work ever since. That's a key part of what he does, it's making math beautiful. I was invited to the launch of the Jaguar in New York. Uh, towards the end of the evening, I was hanging out with one of the main system architects of the Jaguar. And he started telling me how he thought uh, Tempest wasn't very good. He said it really didn't show the potential of the Jaguar. He said Atari only really have it on their list as like a make-weight game, it's not going to amount to anything, it's a bit rubbish, you know. <laughs> Fucking hell, the design of the Jaguar is slagging off my game, I mean, we don't like that. And then it came time to go out for, for final test. I 
I can't remember which show they were coming home for, but uh, they said the Tempest 2000s won best in show at some, some big exhibition. I went, what? And I thought Atari really didn't think that much of it. And then suddenly it was like, wow, yeah, actually, they, <laughs> they seem to be really liking it. And um, yeah, so then it came out on the Jaguar and people didn't hate it. Yes! 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 Nobody can do Tempest better than Jeff. Tempest 2000, that was the flagship game. That was the killer app. Like, if you had a Jaguar, you had to have Tempest 2000. When I got that game, I literally just played it for weeks and weeks and weeks and fell in love with it. And having things like the helper drone as sort of like a slightly easier mode to ease you into the gameplay means that you can kind of explore what it is about this game without really needing a huge amount of instruction. It just basically is the perfect thing to create a game that is very addictive, very rewarding, without being too tough, but still incredibly challenging. Super Zapper Recharge. Jeff took the idea of a Tempest and it turned it into something that was so much better. I think for many people, the Atari Jaguar was just a, a, a Tempest 2000 machine. It just was kind of everything you needed for an addictive game in this really amazing sounding looking package. From the point I put this into the Jaguar, uh, that was kind of me gone for a while. <laughs> Tempest is the perfect example. And Jeff's curiosity of like, oh, I wonder, what if? And now it's just become like, you know, the one of the big stories of his career, one of the big stories of his life. What a awesome game. I just love Tempest 2000. When the Jag came along, I fell for it totally. And Atari offered me the chance to bring up to date one of my all-time favorite classic game designs, Tempest. The results, most people would agree, weren't too shabby. So Atari gave me the shot I needed to complete my return from the wilderness back to the mainstream. Here's a Tempest 2000 ad. It's touted for its outrageous Meltovision graphics. Love it. Do the math. Here we go with the Jag, right? Thanks to Atari giving me that break, the name of the Yak is known by people who never had a C64 and ST. And there are a few more people on the planet thinking about llamas. And that was from a Llamasoft website in 95. I love it. Llamasoft's later years. Today, Llamasoft is a two-man operation. Jeff's partner and co-developer Ivan Giles Zorzin has been instrumental in keeping Llamasoft's games flowing. Let's take a look. Jeff obviously is brilliant. Like he's still doing that thing. He's still doing the games. People remember Llamasoft and the long history, and people sometimes forget that there are two of us here, and these games aren't just Jeff Minter games anymore. It's Llamasoft, and Llamasoft is the pair of us. But it was getting to the point where you need more than one person to do your stuff, really. When Giles first came along, it was at exactly the right time. So they, they'd met and they'd become friends online and got chatting. And obviously realised that there was a lot in common because Giles is, you know, is a, a complete ninja coder. One thing we have in common with Jeff, I will say, we have an idea in mind. We both like to see it becoming something tangible, something you can touch it or play with it or feel it. Uh, for Jeff, it was mostly software. For me, it's also about hardware. Giles is almost as eccentric and unique as Jeff is, but in a, his own special way. Jeff is the kind of person that can solve things in a way that probably most people would not using unconventional methods maybe, but he gets things done. I'm much more into maybe a more formal approach about how to solve things. He's this mad Italian coder who has his own particular strengths and it seems that they fit together quite nicely. You know, I think our nerdery is well aligned, if you want to put it that way. And I think without Giles, there would not be as many Jeff Minter games in the world as there are right now. Now with Giles, Jeff is developing better technology, and that's given him the ability to stay independent. He can just concentrate on the game. He's probably got a deeper level of thought and understanding of game design than he's ever had. That's something I've got a lot of time for Jeff in that every single game there's something that's a bit new now and pushes stuff forward. 
I like doing light synthy stuff. And we decided that since the light synth was quite versatile and could come up with a lot of cool effects, then why not use this to build games in? I mean, actually have that capability as a starting point for making games. At that time, Space Giraffe was the closest integration I'd done of the light synth and the game. The game was literally sitting inside a visualizer effect for all the levels, and I had a very specific design objective to use the psychedelic visuals in the background as part of the difficulty of the game. So basically, it started to become we were more correct to say a framework, but we called it the Neon Engine. What he did is, without getting too nerdy about the technical stuff, he came up with this concept of what you call a virtual machine. And the idea of a virtual machine is a layer of software. I mean, much like, I guess, these days, you've got things like Unreal Engine or Unity. So you've got a platform where you code to the platform, but then that underneath translates to the hardware it's on. And it makes my life easier, because I just code to the Neon Engine, and he makes sure that it works, no matter which, what, where it gets deployed. So we had like a subset on the, on the Vita, we've got it on the PS4, we've got it on the Xbox One, we've got it on the PC. He's not created like an engine that just does one thing, he's created an editor that allows him to make very varied things, which is great. It's in Space Draft, it's in Red Runner Revolution, it's in every game since then as well. That's like uh, the engine of what he makes today, like in a real literal sense as well. I think this is a continuation of a journey that's been going on for 30, 40 years. There's hardly been a point when just made a computer game where he's not made a visualizer, and I don't ever want that to stop. You know, and whatever feeds whatever, I don't care as long as Jeff gets to keep making the thing because they just keep getting better. He, he's like, he's an artist that just gets more and more powerful, you know? I don't, I, there shouldn't be like, oh yeah, you can retire now. There's a new thing, get on it. Yeah, like, job's not done. Just love it, guys. So the final piece here, uh, sadly in the collection, Heart of Neon. The video features in these timelines was directed by Paul Doherty, who is currently producing a feature documentary by Jeff and Giles titled Heart of Neon. In this clip, Paul gives some insight into his incoming film. The first Jeff Mendry game I bought was a game called Abductor. The aliens would swirl in at the top and swoop down and you had to shoot them. And it reminded me of the arcade games I would play when we were on vacation with the family at the beach, you know, like Space Invaders and uh, Galaga and stuff like that. That had that simple arcade experience that I liked. So I was familiar with Lama up to Jeff Mendry's name. So when Gridware came out, I'm like, well, of course, I'm on board for that. And that was the one. That was the game. This game, there was something about it was transformative. This person who made this game understood all the things I loved about arcade games. I played it to death. <laughs> when I became a filmmaker, I wanted to make a film about video games because the first proper job I had was in video games. I was a video game graphic designer in the uh, mid to late 80s. It would be my first career, I was super nostalgic for it. And the difference between the way it is now and the way it was then, I thought there, I thought there was a story there. So I cast about for a story. A friend of mine who I used to work with in the games industry said, well, you should do a film about Jeff. Jeff's career spans the history of like the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. That's generations of like hardware technology and game development and like the business has evolved so many times. Jeff's been, Jeff could be the constant throughout that story. <laughs> Each game shows you a snapshot of history at that time. And it's just a unique opportunity to show the development of an artist and the development of the medium that he's working in. And encapsulating that in the story of a guy's struggle to get his art out into the world. That was a sketch that I went into production with. What happened through those interviews, something much more compelling to me emerged out of it. And I was aware that Jeff had done the lights in. Light synth has been like Jeff's passion project since the early 80s. 
And then I didn't make the connection at first. So Jeff would have these parties at the farm every weekend at one point, and they were doing this thing with this light synthesizer. One of them would DJ and they would party all night till the sun came up. And Jeff talked about the context of how they became really close friends during this, and, and it was a magical time that was that could never be repeated kind of thing. But what he was really telling me was about this project he and his friends developed and presented to Microsoft. A project that would change everything Jeff did for the rest of his career. What they were making was something Jeff would call Neon. And Neon is something that defines Jeff and the relationship Jeff has with his fans. You know, it meant something. I, I wanted to find out what that was. A lot of people understand that they feel connected to a musician or a singer. A lot of people feel connected to an actor or a writer. Um, but it's rare to say that people feel connected to a video game designer. And I met a bunch of people who all said it and meant it in a, in a, in a way that was real, in a way that was completely unexpected to me. I think the story of Neon is a story about someone who never gave up. And uh, I think we all need that. When I was like 13 or maybe even younger than that, I can remember lying in the dark listening to music. And in my head, I would imagine like sort of abstract geometric shapes sort of doing stuff in time to the music. I was like 14 years old, sitting there daydreaming in my English class. You know, people daydream about being a rock star and playing the guitar on the stage. I was daydreaming about doing something I didn't quite know what, but with big screens with stuff happening on them and lights going off. It's just there as part of my imagination. It's a kind of voluntary synesthesia, maybe you'd call it. And I always wanted one day to make a machine that would let me somehow perform these things that I have in my head and put them out on a screen for other people to see. After I'd been doing video games for a while, I just thought, why don't I try making this light instrument? And that became this four-player interactive light synth. And that could have been the start of something extraordinary. The main problem was that I could never sell it because nobody knows they want it. And they won't know they want it until they've actually tried it. So in the end, the only way I've been able to develop the techniques is by bringing it into video games. Jeff's story ends up being kind of like a road trip through video game history, but the road keeps going. I mean, this guy's been around for so long. Aren't you curious to know why? <laughs> I can't wait for that documentary. I actually interviewed Paul Doherty on that Atari show, as well as Tony Longworth, whose music you may recognize from Atari Newsline in that as well. It says the yak is back. While our story ends here, the history of Lamasop is still being written. Somewhere in Wales, the sheep are still grazing on a grassy meadow, and Jeff Winter is still there, making the games he wants to play the way he wants to make them. Very nice, guys. So that is the end of the documentary here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go through. I noticed I didn't get 100% on some of these. So I'm going to go and try to find out what I missed. And on some of these, they're simple. Like um, I think at the end here is the one that I didn't let um, count right toward the percentage. But, which means you basically have to have your uh, your cursor or input area put on certain areas um, here that unlock the percentages. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at these. Now this is just inevitable. This happens to me every time. Happened to me with Atari 52. <laughs> so, um, but let's go ahead and go through and try to find out what I missed to get that 100% because I think it unlocks something, um, something else uh, for this compilation that we'll play. One final game. So let me know what you think about uh, um, Lamasoft, the Jeff Mentor story, guys. I think it's fantastic. I am going to play this final game and show you the credits as well before we finish up. 
so it looks like I found this one. Uh, we'll move on to the other one, to the Harriers, and see what I miss. But just such a fantastic interactive documentary. I love this game, you guys. Um, so, yeah, I will give my final score after I play this final game once I get to it. Uh, but just fantastic. I highly recommend you go watch my Paul Doherty interview on that Atari show um, a few months ago where he talks about Heart of Neon and this documentary coming out. This is the footage that Digital Clips use within this game and the videos. So I am so excited to see that whole documentary kind of come together. Um, it is just going to be amazing. I'm pretty sure it's coming out this year. So stay tuned to BCB and that Atari show at Atari Newsline for all the latest about the documentary. I'll definitely keep you informed about that. So I'm just going through just making sure that I collected everything and everything counted. And here in a minute I will come across it and then we'll be able to play that final game. But again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe, like, and comment to the channel. If you have not, let me know if you enjoyed um, all five parts of this, the Llama Soft Jet Mentor story on the Nintendo Switch. Next episode, guys, of No Filter HD, I will be playing uh, some Atari BCS games again. There have been several games out, like Cash Cow DX. I have not played at length for you guys because of this feature. And that's fine. I wanted to feature this game. But there are some awesome games that need to be... Uh, they need some love too on the filter HD for the VCS. So we'll be taking a look at those. So, um, and also uh, perhaps Lunar Lander Beyond uh, will be coming up soon as well. So um, just looking through this here, making sure I got everything again. Um, there is so much to look at and explore that it's kind of, you know, it's going to happen at some point. You're going to miss something to unlock. So let's go ahead and finish off this here. But yeah, just fantastic. Um, so I also wanted to apologize about the last ver the last part, part four. There was some video stuttering in that uh, episode that came from OBS being a you-know-what to me. Uh, but I did not want to go back and redo that. So it didn't affect the gameplay or the rest of the documentary, just the actual videos that played. So my apologies for that. Sometimes you just can't help that stuff. It's just going to happen, you know. But I was also in Texas. I went to Texas for my mother's birthday and my early birthday celebration. So I planned to have this out that weekend and I did not get around to it. I was just too busy that weekend to get to it. So my apologies for you having to wait. But um, I didn't want to rush it out too quickly. I wanted to actual, actually do it the same way. So I did take it a little bit. So, um, But just fantastic game. I also wanted to thank Digital Clips for sending me a digital copy of this for review. For free, that was just amazing. I don't get a lot of freebies like that, and it did not influence my review at all. However, it didn't need to. I mean, what a fantastic compilation. Now look at this, Grid Runner Remastered is in here now, 2023. So let's go ahead and check that out again and play it. Complexity of two llamas. New for 2023, Digital Clips has updated Llamasoft's classic Grid Runners based on the original Commodore C64 code with an all new look. I cannot wait, guys. Let's play this newer version of Grid Runner. What a fantastic game. Thank <laughs> you. 
Just such a great game, guys. I just love this Grid Runner Remaster. Just fantastic. Please go play this. It is great. I love it. So here's the game library. Showed you a little bit of this before. Let's go ahead and take a look. First of all, let's save that. And I want to just show you real quickly um, the gameography and some of the other aspects in here that we've seen before. I just love this compilation. It is great. There's a bunch of games in here. Now, I... I I actually wish that some of these older games were in here too. I wish there was an Aka R version we could play. I do have that on my VCS. It is great. Moose Life, I've never played that. So I would love to play Minotaur Arcade as well. I do have Tempest 4000. Um, uh, but I want to play Space Giraffe and Neon and all these other games too that we didn't have in this compilation. There's just so many out there that Jeff Mentor made. He was such an integral part of the games community. Um, for many decades and I just wanted to say Jeff we appreciate you so much and I want to get this compilation by Digital Eclipse an A plus it took my breath away from the very beginning the visuals I mean everything works just like Atari 50 did which inspired this this is just amazing I'm loving this Gold Master series definitely check out Lamasoft the Jet Mentor story check out Karateka as well which was the release out before this um, and check out Atari 50 which is kind of what started this all. Just a fantastic compilation. So I'm going to go and go back into the game, you guys, and just show you the credits at the end here and a couple other things, and then we'll finish this out. So uh, thank you so much for watching. No Filter HD, as I said. Um, loving the Jeff Mentor story, Llamasoft. It gets an A-plus from me. It is a fantastic documentary. Um, such an integral part of gaming history. Jeff is just amazing and... Uh, his games will live on in infamy in this compilation. But definitely stay tuned, as I said, to No Filter HD. In the future, we'll be looking at brand new Atari VCS games that we'll, we'll be playing. We'll be taking a look at Cash Cow DX. We'll be taking a look at Asteroids Deluxe and uh, Asteroid V Claw and all kinds of cool games that have come out since I've made this. So definitely stay tuned for that. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you. Also, let me know down below what your favorite Jeff Mentor game is or was. Uh, my favorite is probably, I'm, I'm going to have to be lame here, it's probably going to be Tempest 2000 and Grid Runner. Those are my two favorites. And, you know, Llamatron 2112 definitely is up there, too. There are so many Jeff Mentor games I love. Um, and many I played in this compilation, like Void Runner, I never played before, and I freaking love. So there are some great games in here that um, I'm sure not everyone has played around the world because Jeff has been so integral in the community for so many decades. I also love his affinity for sheep. 
I think that is just awesome. I'm a big pet lover myself. So uh, definitely um, excited to share this uh, little bit of history with you. And it's been my pleasure to read this as well. I know it hasn't been perfect, but at least you can watch and listen to the whole game and really uh, discover who Jeff Mentor was. He is such a big part of gaming history and Atari history as well. All right, guys. So just want to show you here. Um, this is awesome. It says, at Digital Clips, we believe classic games are the foundational art on which our industry was built and deserve a higher class of treatment and preservation. So the Goldmaster series was created and published by Digital Clips, preserves the authentic authentically uh, restores landmark titles from gaming's history while celebrating the accomplishments. Just love it. Thanks for watching, you guys. I appreciate you so much. Make sure to subscribe, like, and comment. Listen, Coffee Boy here signing out. I'll see you later, guys. Bye now. You are watching Ballistic Hawk Hollywood.